ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه واله وسلم وبعد ابا ونس ذا از نو ون ورثي اوف ورشيب اكسبت الله اند ذا محمد از ا سليفر مسنجر اند ام ادريت يو ذا وارمست جريتينجز اوف بيس ذا جريتينجز اوف اسلام السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Jazak Allah khair thanks for everyone for coming. Um, inshallah, what's going to happen is I'm going to get, make a few quick announcements. Uh, there's going to be an auction at the end of the at the end of the talk. Um, Mufti is going to speak, um, then he's going to take some questions. And there's pens and paper at the end of the each row, so you can uh, write your questions down and hand them. There's no fire alarm planned, so if you hear it alarm, gently, quietly, please make your way out. And um, inshallah, there's a Dawa stall on the outside as well. To, um, it's going to tell you about what uh, activities ISOC normally run, uh, which such as uh, you know Dawa stalls on uh, 12 to 3 in the atrium on Mondays, uh, Sisters Tajweed on Tuesdays uh, 5 to 6, yeah. and um, on Wednesday we've got Brothers Football, and later on inshallah we'll be doing a swimming with the with the Libyan Society. Um, Thursday we have Sister Circles at 5:15 to 6:15 in the prayer room. Brother Circle, 6.30 to 7.30 in the prayer room. And obviously Friday we've got our Jumma, inshallah. Also, uh, we're going to be selling some popcorn. Uh, if you got, any of you know about the uh, Strangers Tour, uh, we've still got stuff left over from that, so we'll uh, that be there. And um, without further ado, I'm just going to say a few words about uh, uh, Mufti Ismail Musa Menk. That's okay. Okay, I'll do it anyway, I'll do it anyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ismail Musa Menk was born in Harare, Zimbabwe. He was tutored by his father, who is a well-known scholar in Dai. He completed his, his hifz and recitation courses at an early age and learned Arabic and Esperanto languages while studying Sharia under his father. At the same time, he attended an academic college in Harare, where he completed his secondary secular education. He then attained a degree in Sharia from the University of Medina, and later specialized in Iftar al darul Ulum Kantharia in Gujarat. He's a broad-minded motivational speaker who has won the hearts of many. He teaches at Darul Ulum in Harare and finds the time to attend many international religious conferences, seminars at Trotsda. He's an active member of the Majlis al Ulama Zimbabwe and heads its Iftar department. He's also one of the Imams at the Akhilia Masjid in Harare. He's invited on lecture tours to many countries. He contributes towards the Islamic content of various media networks and is an experienced social worker and counsellor. I've actually heard uh, a Mufti speak before and uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, mashallah, he's very good in life, Christian in knowledge. But without further ado, I'll pass it over. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> inshallah, I will commence with a recitation of the Quran for purpose of barakah as usual, inshallah. Bismillah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون 
هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم who was sent to us in order to give us the message to remove us from darkness towards the light we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all his companions, to bless his household, to bless all those who have struggled and strived to protect the deen. They learnt it, they practiced it, they conveyed it to others in such a way that today it has come to us. May Allah bless them and bless every one of us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the acceptance to be upright and steadfast at all times. And may Allah make us from those who can get closer to Him as the days pass and not from amongst those who drift further away as the days pass. And may Allah bless our offspring to come up to the day of Qiyamah and may He keep them all on the straight path. Amen. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, Alhamdulillah, it is an honor for me to be seated here or to be standing, inshallah. The brother was offering me to sit and I told him, inshallah, I'll stand. We're not yet 75, mashallah. <laughs> Uh, and it's an honor to be here, to be used, to be able to share a word of Islam. Those of you who might be familiar with my method of speaking, I normally like to speak to the young more informally than others would choose. The reason is we need to plug in. We need to feel that we are part of one family. I'm no different from you. How many fingers do I have? And how many do you have? Don't tell me 10, mashallah. <laughs> On one hand, we're talking about. So we are the same. We are all trying to achieve the pleasure of Allah. I was born, so were you. Nobody dropped from heaven, you know. Like the one brother sees another sister, you know, looking gorgeous, mashallah. <laughs> he says, and he says, was it painful? <laughs> so she says, we're talking about pain today, isn't it? So he says, was it painful? And she's like, what do you mean? When you fell from heaven? <laughs> so none of us fell from heaven as such, but we were born to mothers, mashallah. One of the most painful, the most painful experiences that a female can go through is the experience of childbearing. So much pain, forgotten within split seconds of seeing the result. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So much pain, can I word it, near death, near death, <coughs> forgotten within split seconds when the result is seen. Now remember that, that's the introduction to today's topic. I started that way, you started that way, our mothers sacrificed, from amongst us there may be mothers as well, and there will be inshallah sisters who will all be mothers by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at some stage in their lives. May Allah grant us spouses who will be the coolness of our eyes. Look, the I mean, is always loud. <laughs> so we ask Allah really to open our doors. We all would like to see a good life. Believe me, we all are heading in one direction. As I said, we started in the same way. Do you know that we are going to end also in a similar way? Everyone ends in one way, in the sense that I'm going to die and so are you. Kullu 
وَفَاتِحَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازَ What a powerful verse. Allah says, Every soul shall taste death. And towards the end of the verse, Allah says, Whoever is saved from the fire and granted entry into Jannah, they will be the successful. They are the successful. So I would like to see success and so would you. I want to go to paradise and so do you. It is irrelevant what is in paradise. Someone might say, what do you mean it's irrelevant? My brain and yours will never, ever, ever understand what is in paradise. I spoke about this a few days ago when I said, what would you love for there to be in paradise? <coughs> well, anything that you can think of does not qualify to be there. Because the hadith says, if your brain can think about it, sorry, this brain is too small to think about what's in Jannah. <laughs> in Jannah is that which no eye has ever seen. So, mashallah, you can see DDG, drop dead gorgeous. This will be seen. <laughs> this will be stand alive gorgeous, inshallah. You know, you don't need to drop dead, alhamdulillah. It's something beyond comprehension. If, if your mind has seen, as thought of anything, it doesn't qualify to be in Jannah. If your ears have heard of something, it doesn't qualify to be in Jannah, not because it is bad, but because in Jannah is better than that. And let me try and bring it closer. We have a mobile phone here, mashallah, we have fruit that doesn't look so bad, mashallah, we've got water, we've got, you know, everything here. I'm sure we've got expensive watches and perfumes and clothings and so on, and mashallah, all latest gadgets and iPhones and M phones and so on, mashallah. No, don't ask me what's an M phone, I just made it up. If you look at all that which I would love in this world and you would love in this world, where is it from? It's from the earth, that's all. Nothing. That, that can be of use to me or you comes from anywhere but the earth itself. So your glasses, where are they made from? It's sand. Sand, compression and temperature. You know, temperature and pressure together makes glass, okay, with sand. And if you have, for example, plastic, where does it come from? It comes from the earth. If you have a motor vehicle, where does it come from? Well, the metal comes from somewhere it was mined. And then you have the leather is from a cow, I hope. It's, I hope it's not a pig, actually. The leather comes from a cow. Uh, everything, all the other gadgets come from different places on the earth. Nothing has come from Pluto or Venus or anywhere else. Nothing. Because we as human beings cannot benefit from anything that has come from outside the earth. So we have not yet crossed the threshold and the boundary of imagination because it's beyond our scope. We've never ever seen it, we don't know about it. It's only been spoken about to bring it close to the human mind which is not the perfect mind. It might be the best mind, but it's not perfect. Allah has kept it. We can't even see the unseen. If I were to tell you, wow, there's about 500,000 jinns in this room, you'd say, what? I think we'd be empty in a minute. We wouldn't need the alarm that he spoke about at the beginning. Without the alarm, we'd all be gone. We cannot see, there may be, Allah knows best. We cannot see what is termed in Islam as the unseen, let alone things of the future or let alone things of Jannah. So this is why we say there is a result. We are going through something, every one of us knows we are going to end. There's no question about this issue of ending. We are going to end, I'm going to end and so are you. The winner is the one who can get to Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant that to us all. So if that is our common purpose and common goal, it reminds me of the World Cup, which happened in South Africa, I think it was last year, or was it early this year? I've forgotten already. 2010, last year, yes, mashallah. When the people had a ticket for a match, they made sure they got to Johannesburg prior to the match, by a day at least, minimum, and they made sure they got to the stadium prior to the match by so many hours and they made sure they got in well within the time and they made sure they got to their seats well within the time because all those who held these tickets had a common purpose they had a common aim they wanted to get to one place 
All of us here, may Allah grant us that ticket of Jannah, without exception, every one of us. So when it comes to certain things, we need to be found in a specific place together, mashallah, in the sense that we're heading in the direction. If it's come time for salah, those who have that ticket need to find themselves on the musalla. Come time for obedience of Allah, those with that ticket need to find themselves there. Now let me tell you, it might be painful to make the journey all the way to Johannesburg, painful to get to the, you know, to the place. It's like Hajj, for example. It's a better example, the example of Hajj, where you have to do certain things. If you're a Hajji, you've spent your money, you planned in advance and you've gone and so on. But because it's spiritual, I'd like to keep it aside. Let's talk about something dunya, something connected to this world. The reason why I want to do this is there's, there's a greater uh, co conclusion that I'd like to draw. So, if we're all, for example, heading in that direction, we should be found doing the same things. Let me give you one more example. <coughs> if subhanallah I am a student of medicine and I know the fees have been paid I need to make an effort to get from whatever city I am to Bradford for example every day at a specific time find myself in the hall if I'm not I've wasted my time if I'm not I've lost my purpose so we understand this when it comes to that which is connected to the worldly items such as your degree such as something you'd like to achieve. Foolish would be the one who has a World Cup ticket or for example Formula One that is happening right now, I don't know if it's finished in Abu Dhabi and you have a ticket for it and whilst the main, the main race is going on for example, you busy at McDonald's across the road. You flew all the way, you have the ticket, you purchased it, you claim to be a fan, you'd like to go, you'd like to watch, and then come time and you found at McDonald's across the road. Is that not foolish? Very, mashallah. Everyone is silent. They're wondering what I'm going to draw from it. Well, I claim to be a fan in the sense that I want to be, I am part of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We all claim to be and we all are, inshallah. And at the same time, I would like Jannah. I am working towards it. I have basically bought a ticket for it. That's what I've done. So why is it that when time comes for those who are supposed to be holding these tickets to be in a specific place, we found elsewhere? We shouldn't be doing that. How can I be found in a pub or a nightclub or elsewhere when the time for Salah is there? It's so important. And then I would like to think to myself, well, you know what, what do I gain from this Salah? You know, it's so much pain. I've got to get up early in the morning. I've got to read. I've got to wash. It's so cold. You know, it's starting to... It's going to be snowing soon. And you know when I turn the tap on, it's like my hands are numb. I've got to let it run for a while before the hot water comes out. What should I do that for? What's the, what's the gain in it? Wallahi, my beloved brothers and sisters, life is not just one item, it is two. We have the preparation for the rest of our life and preparation for the, for the eternal life after this life. You die once. After death, is there any other death? No, you only die once. So what is the definition of death? The beginning of the eternal life that has no death. That's the definition of it. So for us, people ask me, how does it feel like to die? Thank you very much. It's like I died and I came back to tell you. <laughs> Subhanallah. I don't know, but I can tell you that it might be very difficult because the hadith says, Ala inna lil mawti la sakarat. Definitely death has pangs, very painful. But you have to go through that pain in order to get to the akhirah, in order to gain absolutely everything thereafter. So for example, a person might be on their deathbed, once they've died, any more pain? By the will of Allah, no. For as long as they had handled all the pain in their lives. But one who refused to have any pain in their lives and did as they pleased, you know, did anything they wanted, no salah, no form of a link with their creator, they didn't have any pain, they may, Allah protect us all, they may have to face some form of pain a little bit later on. Better to face it now than later on. But those who have already endured and been through a lot, you know, it takes a lot just to put on a scarf on your head. It takes a lot just to put on a scarf on your head. I can call it a pain in a country of this nature for a lot of people because it is something that a lot of people would scoff at, a lot of people would laugh at, 
the pressures around. People have now known us as big terrorists, you know. It's sad. We're not. So, you know, people will start calling you all sorts of names. And it's very difficult. We need to be able to endure that in order to dress appropriately. Obviously, the word appropriately is a very broad word. And I like to use that word because each one of us has their own struggle. I mean, the brothers, the sisters, those who are putting on a scarf, those who are not, mashallah, all of us are heading, inshallah, in the right direction. The fact that you might not be dressed so appropriately does not necessarily mean that you're not linked with your maker. You might have a greater link than I do and anyone else does in this hall. But that is only known by Allah. What we are trying to say is, let's take a step ahead. You need to make decisions, painful decisions in life. Make them, adopt them, fulfill them and carry on. When you wanted to come to varsity to study your field, it was a difficult decision. I think a lot of us here would probably have been confused. What field do I want to study? What would I like to uh, do? Should I do this? Should I do that? I think some of you might have changed one year down the line. It must have happened, I'm sure. Two years down the line. <coughs> some of you might have completely graduated and then changed from one to the other because they realized you know what i did this and this was my field and everything but it's not good enough for me it was a painful decision but why you were losing time you had to make the decision so when you made the decision and entered the varsity a year later you decided no this is the wrong thing i need to get out of here so with all of us mashallah we have spiritual moments where we need to make a decision i want to graduate from a spiritual high school to a spiritual varsity my spiritual level is now, mashallah, you know, GCSEs and I've got A's, inshallah, and I need to get to a spiritual higher level. In the same way that none of us would like to be put back into year one all the time, we, every one of us would love to see that we develop year one, year two, year three, and in a little while we're out. Yes? No one would like to see themselves repeating, so spiritually as well. I want to pass and so do you. I would not like to remain on level one forever. It is a painful way of getting ahead. Look at the amount of pain we go through, mashallah, to graduate. Examinations are round the bend, am I right? Yeah. Round the bend, mashallah. Mashallah. <laughs> and everyone is studying and swatting four o'clock in the morning and we still have our books and mashallah. And, and you know, book after book after book. It's painful, but what is the game? Mashallah, I will pass. I'm going to get to level two. Big deal, mashallah. <laughs> Big deal, level two. We got to level two. Allah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us benefit of that. Sometimes we may not see the end. Allah might take us away. When He takes us away, may He be pleased with us. May He make it easy for us. May He take us away with a smile. May He grant us paradise without reckoning because we would be too embarrassed about our deeds. And we have heard from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, there will be a large number of people who will enter paradise without reckoning. When Allah loves a little deed of yours, He can pull you straight through and say, I don't want to see anything else. No other deeds of yours would I like to see. There's one thing you did, just go ahead, mashallah. Allah grant that to us. Why I'm banking on that, inshallah. And I hope we all are. Although banking might be Islamically questioned. <laughs> So what we need to know is, look at the amount we are prepared to do in order to move from one year to the next, every one of us. I think we'd be foolish if we were seated at this varsity thinking that I don't need to study, at these books are okay, I don't need to get there on time. We're ready to do so much in order to gain what? A little bit. Mashallah, you might graduate with an honors degree, you might graduate with you know, a master's and a PhD. Alhamdulillah, how far is it going to take you? And what was the amount of pain involved? A lot of pain, a lot of dedication, a lot of effort. Then you got your degree, then your master's, then your PhD, alhamdulillah. And thereafter, you were able to work and to practice and you earned lots of money and you drove the best vehicle and you had the best house. But to drive that vehicle and to have the home, you need to work hard and you need to make a very, very big effort, mashallah. And what happened as a result? We had a, a beautiful life. Okay? Why I am here today is to take you beyond that. There is something beyond this life. And it is not as difficult as the preparation for the ease of this life. I want to repeat that. To prepare for the Akhirah and for the life after death and for paradise is not as difficult as the preparation for the next few years. And I can prove it to you. Look, let me ask you questions and you can respond. How many years have you been at school? Starting from grade one, let's count. 
1 to 7, I'm, I'm talking my system, 1 to 7, 7 to 7 plus 4 is 11. I think 11 years you get to your GCSEs, am I right? 11 years, then after that minimum 4 years varsity, am I right? 11 plus 4 is? Maths is weak. Okay, 15. <laughs> there you are. 15 plus possibly another one, two of experience and so on. So 15, 16 years we are studying. Okay? And even if you become a doctor, doctors a little bit more. Let's say someone's become a doctor and mashallah, you know, they're earning and they, they've got their wealth and they've got their practice and so on. They need to get points. They need to learn some new, what do you call it, the developments every now and again. They need to be registered. They need to attend conferences and they need to attend seminars and they get their points and so on every single year. And it's so difficult. And they need to work. How long do they need to work? If you, if, if you see a practice of a doctor, does it say there, open five times a day for ten minutes? Does it say that? Does it say that at any doctor's practice? What does it say? <coughs> Open 8 to 5. We may not even close for lunch. The doctor has his sandwich behind. Hang on a second. I'm coming with a stethoscope. And he goes back. Tap, 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 tap. He's got a sandwich there. Come. Oh, sorry. Yes. It can happen depending on how busy he is. And what has he done that for? He's ready to work from 8 to 5. Imagine. 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So much pain. But for what? To be able to live from 5 o'clock to the following 8 o'clock. That's all. That's it. That's it. And half that time he'll be fast asleep. Allahu Akbar. So look at the amount of pain we are ready to go through as human beings in order to live for the rest of the day. And we live, we work whole week in order to get the Sunday off and we can then go to Alton Towers or somewhere, mashallah, you know. Subhanallah. Why? And that also happens how often? How often do people go to these amusement parks? Once a year, twice a year? And we were sweating, sweating throughout the year in order to make one trip to Malaysia, mashallah. One trip to Thailand, Phuket, very beautiful, scenic, mashallah. Hope the floods don't come when you go. Allah, Allah. <laughs> but this is what we're ready to do. And Allah says, hang on, think very carefully. And that's why I am here to make myself think and to make yourselves think. Imagine if I have to prepare for a whole life after death that is eternal. Allah says, you open your business five times a day for ten minutes. There you are. And we still sing, ah, I don't need to do that. You know, why should I? And Allah says, okay, I just like you, dress, you to dress in a specific way. That's it. Not even something so difficult. And we say, no. Whereas when we go to school and they tell us to come up with such a silly uniform, we will pay to buy it. We'll put their emblem and logo here and we'll probably put our name at the back and everything depending on where, you know, what school we go to. And we're ready to wear the uniform for the school because we want a little certificate to say, I graduated from St. Michael's. And when Allah says, look, I'm not going to make you wear an emblem. Imagine if we had to wear an emblem here saying something, you know. I used to tell people before that if we had a slate on our foreheads saying whether you've read the last Salah or not, we would all read Salah five times a day. We just need a slate on the head. You know, at last Salah read, that's what it said, and then at the bottom it says Maghrib, Mashallah. It says, imagine if someone says three years back Asr. <laughs> so we need to think of this, that amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not asked much of us. And if we're not convinced, sit and calculate what we're doing in order to earn a livelihood. And we see, we, why is it that people become lazy when it comes to Allah's instruction? Because they sometimes do not see the immediate results of that. They don't see the immediate results of that. So, when we're working, we earn pounds. Every week, mashallah, we get so many pounds. You know, a customer, a client comes one day, a doctor came to me and says, you know, make dua, my business flourishes. I said, what? I should say, Allah, make everybody sick so they can go to that man. Is that what you want me to say? <laughs> but that's basically something that the doctor, I hope, is not praying for. Because if the doctor's praying for more clients, it makes me sick. And so does it make you. However, he needs money. When he gets money, what does he buy? He buys a beautiful car. He has a lovely home. He goes on holiday now and again. And he has, a, you know, a few luxuries. Until when? Until the day his kidneys pack up. May Allah protect us. Then what? His life changes. Ask those who don't have health. Ask those who are healthy, powerful, solid people whose pancreas has packed up. Ask those who are healthy, solid, powerful, who suddenly went paralyzed. Ask them. 
This is why the hadith says, اغتنم خمسا قبل خمس. Seize these opportunities before they are overtaken by situations and you will regret. The opportunity of your health, the opportunity of your life, the opportunity of your wealth, the opportunity of your, of your, of your young age and of your free time. You, we need to seize these opportunities. Today we are seated here. None of you, after some time, would come back to this varsity except maybe for a talk or two sometimes. But you are here during your varsity years. Make the most of it. Let these years be the years when you've gone closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an investment that's worth it. You know, there was a young girl, 14 years old, who passed away. Allah grant her Jannah. The mom spoke to me and says, you know, I really cannot forgive myself. And I said, why? And she says, because we had everything. I sent my daughter to the best schools. She, had, she spoke English very well. She was a top A grade student from the very beginning. But I never ever told her that Allah exists. Everything I've done, at hindsight, I shouldn't have done. And I said, why do you say that? She says, only now do I realize that I needed to have balanced what I did. In the same way I sent her to the best schools, I should have at least you know, technology is such that on the screen you can learn your deen. Just make sure it's from the right source. We're so fortunate. Today, I'm, I'm here. I'm sure a lot of you might know me prior to having seen me because of this screen. That is technology. That did not happen a few years ago. And yet, if we were not to seize that opportunity, we're at loss. Wallahi, we're at loss. So, my message to you today is... No matter how painful it may seem, let us learn to obey Allah's instruction. Do not let shaitan make you feel that you're useless. No. Shaitan comes to us, the brothers and the sisters. You know, I've committed this sin. I've committed that sin. I've committed, you know, I don't even dress properly. I, I don't even speak properly. I've lied so many times. I may have done this. I may have visited the pub. I may have been, you know, infested by friends who've taken me to pubs and clubs and so on. Believe me. If you just stand up and say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Ya Allah, I've wronged my soul. I've done so much wrong. I regret. Ya Allah, grant me a new beginning. Do you know how happy Allah becomes? Your maker, mine. So none of us should ever feel that we are written off. Let me read the powerful verse of the Quran. Allah says, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inform them, tell them, O oh my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves, never ever lose hope. Never ever lose hope from of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed Allah forgives all <coughs> sins. Every sin is forgiven by Allah. He is most forgiving, most merciful. And the very next verse Allah says, Turn to him before it is too late. So no one knows when it's going to be too late. I may not be able to get back this evening to where I came from. I may not. You might hear the Shaykh has passed away. What will, what will it do to us? <gasps> inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajim. I think it stops there. It might affect us for four or five days. We might put it on Facebook. We might tell the world. We might just say, you know, I was there. And we were there at the last talk and so on. And that's where it stops. But did we take a lesson? That's why we're here. I need a lesson. As much as everyone else does. And this is why when I share a message with you, Wallahi, it is firstly to me, then to everyone else. And I pray Allah grant me the strength to fulfill what I am saying, firstly. So, I've given you a few examples this evening. The first example was that of childbirth. And I told you that so much pain, when we see the result, it's forgotten. Ask the mothers, they will tell you. And then I gave you the example of your life here, showing you and proving to you how much effort we make. How many books have you read? Who is, for example, fourth year? Can someone put their hands up? How many books have you read, for example, roughly? 20. You don't even know? <laughs> 20. How many? 20. 20. 20. Yeah. Okay, 20 books. Each one was roughly what size? Can you show us just by your hand? 
By that much, okay. 20 books, my beloved brother, Allah grant you acceptance. 20 books roughly this size. Did you see that? Allah says, no man, I just want you to read one book roughly that size. <laughs> you see how I've done it? You see how I've worded it? I know of people, Harry Potter, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> and all people. Grannies, mashallah. Harry Potter, mashallah. <laughs> Harry Potter, and they would wish that there would be a seven and an eight. But tell them, Quran, my sister. They will say, what? <laughs> Sorry, I read two, three lines a day. Allahu Akbar. So what we're saying is, it's not wrong to read certain books, maybe, okay, depending on their content and so on. And especially when it comes to books of education, and it's good. You should read them. You should study hard. How many of us are ready for one year alone to study one book in the same way that we study the books of medicine or accounts or law or anything else? How many of us? The answer most probably is very few. We're guilty. That's why we're here to motivate, to show you, Wallahi, my beloved sisters, Wallahi, my beloved brothers, Allah has asked you for much less than the world has demanded from you. Have you seen that today? Much less. And yet we say, oh, it's so hard. It's so difficult. I can't. The Quran don't make sense. You know, it's so rigid. It's so difficult. How can I do this? How? And yet if you sat and you thought for a moment, well, what am I doing? I was with one brother today and he was telling me, I told him, how's life in Britain? He says, it's all about money, brother. <laughs> and I, 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 about two hours later, I told him, brother, I agree with you. It's all about money. We've become material. I'm talking of the bulk of people. So material that, you know, if there's a latest iPhone, we're there. If there's a latest I iPad, we're there. If there's a latest Blackberry, we're there. If there's a latest, you know, any gadget, we're there. And we'd like it, and we want it, and we, we wish for it. We really, even if we can't afford it, you see someone with something of that nature, and you say, Inshallah, I'm going to get one, you know? And you know, you see someone with a vehicle, Inshallah, I will get this. You see someone with sunglasses, Inshallah, I'm going to get that. But remember one thing, it doesn't stop. They intentionally, I am of the I, of opinion that, you know the iPhone, they make a 4 and then they make a, a 4, I think it's a 4S, if I'm not mistaken. Why didn't they just go to 5? Because if they've got 30 updates, they will put 10 and call it a 4S. They will put another 10 because they needed to make money. Then they'll put another 10 and call it a 5. And they'll put another, the other 10 and they'll call it a 5S. Yet had they wanted, they could have put all 30 one time and you would have been able to buy it, but they wouldn't have made money from you. So you, you work, you work so hard and the working sometimes is in order to become prey to those who know how to get that money out of your pocket into their coffers. That's what it is. What why it's there. We don't think of it sometimes. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know what? Be happy with what you have. Be content. You're driving your little, you know, Motor vehicle, Toyota, mashallah, and you know, it's doing your job for you. It might be a smaller Toyota, I go. You know, I go to town, I go to varsity, so they call it Toyota, I go, mashallah. And it brings you there, and alhamdulillah, it should be good, in the sense that I don't need a bigger vehicle. Do I need it? If I don't need it, alhamdulillah, I must be happy with what I have. I need to be happy with my financial condition. I can work for more, but I'm happy with it. At the same time, I need to develop my spirituality. Your link with Allah is only known by you and Allah. I cannot look at a sister and say, you know, you're far from Allah. Never ever. If I do that, I am the one who's far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the link with the Creator is in the heart. But that, must, that statement must not make us justify our outward sin. So that's a balanced statement. The hadith says, Inna Allah ta'ala la yanduru ila suwarikum wa la ila ajsadikum wa lakin yanduru ila amalikum wa qulubikum. Allah does not look at your outward features, nor does He look at your bodies and so on. He looks at what's inside and He looks at your deeds. So there might be a person who's outwardly not so religious looking, as I said last night, for some of you I've seen some faces who were there last night as well. But, you know, outwardly they might not appear to be so religious, but they might be much more religious than some who might look like the biggest clerics of the dunya. Allah protect us. However, I must qualify that statement to say, never use that as a justification to say, hey, what do you think? Don't judge, you know? Let's leave that. I normally like to say, we should not judge, but when someone corrects us, 
Don't pass it away by saying, why are you being judgmental? They have the right to correct you sometimes, but in a polite way, in a respectful way, in a very, very, you know, in, in a manner that is palatable, should I say, you know, digestible, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that goodness to us. So there is a lot of pain that we go through for our day-to-day -day lives, and the result of it is limited and it is temporary. So surely, if we look at the life after death as Muslimin, we believe in it, every one of us. We'd like goodness, inshallah, by obeying the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by learning his instruction, by putting an effort, inshallah, to learning the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to begin with, and then obviously the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we will be able to achieve a lot, a lot, inshallah, not only in the akhirah, but even in the dunya. Some people ask me, I read salah, what is it in there for me? What do I have to gain from getting up in the morning and reading Salah and so on? Beloved brother or sister, whether I can explain that to you today or not, if the Almighty has decreed it for you, you should know that there are benefits, not only health benefits, emotional, physical, spiritual, many, many more benefits that I may not be able to tell you. You may not know that you were saved from so much sickness, from so much emotional stress, from so much discontentment and so on, just because you fulfilled your salah and you made an effort to try and learn what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling you and instructing you. So you will, you will have helped so much. You know, some people say, I've got a rash. So which, which verse of the Quran should I read in order to cure me? Fair enough. That's a question that people ask. There's no specific verse to be cured from a rash. You will have to go to the doctors. You will have to find out. You will have to see. You have to work on your emotions because stress also causes rash and skin irritations and diseases and so on. And over and above that, you need to know that the Qur'an has shifa in it. The Qur'an says, Ya ayyuhal nasu qad jaatkum maw'idhatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudur O people, a warning or a message where the warning has come to you from your maker <coughs> And in it, there is cure for what lies in the hearts, internal, cure. So the Qur'an has cure in it. And there are many verses that prove that there is cure in the Qur'an. So if I were to read from the beginning of the Qur'an, every day a portion, right to the end, listen to what will happen. It might be difficult. As I say, it may be painful in the sense that in today's world, you find people do what's easy for them. No one wants to do what's not easy for them unless they have to. And sadly the Quran says, Kalla bal al ajilata wa tadharoon al akhirah Nay, or behold, you love that which is in front of you, which you can see, which is tangible, which is right there. And you are forgetting the akhirah, which you cannot see right now. We shouldn't do that. So, as I am saying, when we read the Quran from cover to cover, every day a portion with its meaning, it has in it cure for diseases that sometimes we may never know we have. Because I may have, Allah protect me and you all, we may have diseases we don't know. Sometimes in the Akhirah we may get there, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may show us, do you know you had a cancer that was coming up, nobody tested it, nothing happened, but because of your closeness with us and your constant recitation of the Quran, there was shifa in the Quran, we cured you and you didn't even know. Allahu Akbar. So, I could have sicknesses, I've given you the example of cancer, but it could be any other sickness that I don't know about. The Qur'an, I don't know which verses will cure which diseases, but I do know the Qur'an as a whole will cure us as a whole. So let me read the whole Qur'an from cover to cover, and you know, not just little portions of it on a daily basis, I just read one surah and that's it. Better than that is to read the entire book, and it's not so easy. You will require lots of discipline, just like getting up for salah requires a lot of discipline. Do you know what else is very painful? When the time of salah is crossing, whilst you're at varsity. Oh, it's not easy to read your salah. You know, I was on the plane just now, and we were reading salah on, on, on the, uh, mashallah, on the seat. And uh, the lady comes and offers me something, and I'm busy reading salah. What do you do now? I've got an option to break my salah, and... Uh, I just started reading slightly loudly, 
because I would have hoped that she would understand that this is a Muslim reading his salah. Because I cannot say, Raya <laughs> Tiya. You can't do that. You can't do that. So, mashallah, it, it, it's something. And at the same time, it's not easy, it's difficult. But it is more difficult when you're in an environment of this nature, when everybody wants to look at you, and you have to fulfill your salah, you need to find a place, you need to find something you know, that is there, you need to make sure you, you've made wudu, and you need to, so many things. And that is when you deserve a PhD in spirituality. We're ready for our PhD in the dunya. If someone were to tell you, listen, you know what, you're in third year, don't worry, I can get you a PhD if you do X, Y, Z in terms of research. And you say, I've never heard of that. Don't worry, I'm telling it to you. And then you say, okay, let's work. So you've got to work morning to evening, three hours sleep only for one month. I think we'd do it. I would do it, to be honest with you. We're ready to do that. So surely if we're ready to go against everything around us in order to please the Creator in such a way that you know, we've come to the balance. We don't want to say, okay, I'm a Muslim, I want to please Allah. You get to the public toilets and you make wudu, messing the whole place up. You come out in the middle of everywhere, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And your professor looks at you and says, what the hell? That's not what we're talking about. We're saying we're doing it properly. We're trying our best. We will find our corner. We will be making wudu in a proper, nice way without messing the place, without being a pest and a pain so people block us and so on. And we'll try in a very discreet way if possible or the most discreet way possible to read our salah but our link with Allah is my secret. My link and your link with Allah is your secret. I, I don't even need to know your link with Allah. No one needs to know. That's the difference. You know Christianity, they go, I don't know if you've ever seen this but I've seen it, where the sinner goes to the pastor and says, Father, I've sinned. Father says, what have you done? So the man says, well, okay, I did this and I, I lied to my wife. And what did you lie about? What does he need to know everything about? Allahu Akbar. Well, I lied this and I lied that and I lied this and this and this and so on. And after some time, he says a few things and, you know, somebody knows all his secrets and he says, you are forgiven, my son. Allahu Akbar. And he lies to his wife in an even bigger way. So who does he confess to now? So with us, your link with your maker is your secret. You do not need to confess it to anybody. No one needs to know your sin. Not at all. Nobody. Without exception. No one. Just you and Allah. There you are. So your link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your secret. If I tell you, brothers and sisters, have you read Salatul Maghrib? Who has not read Salatul Maghrib? It's not my right to do that. I've got no ways, no right, no authority to question people who has not read Salatul Maghrib. Put your hands up, right? Walk out. Allahu Akbar. That would be the most arrogant statement ever, most unacceptable. It's between you and Allah. But I have the right to tell you, my brothers and sisters, Salah is very important. That's what I did today. That's the beauty of Islam. And this is why we say, yes, that which we go through that has pain in it, has a lot of gain in it. I'm sure you know the English saying, no pain, no gain. <laughs> True. So when, mashallah, we go through something, inshallah, we will have a lot in return. And I want to end by telling you one thing, and that is, as you noticed, this evening, I have concentrated much on the comparison between the amount we are ready to go through for the benefit of the next few years, and the amount Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks from us, and that is much less, but we still find ourselves excelling in that one and not in this one. And this is what I'd like everyone to go home and think about, inshallah. I hope and I pray I've uttered words that are uh, beneficial. Somebody's actually calling to say it's enough now. So inshallah, we will call it a day or a night, inshallah. Uh, I will end by taking a few questions relevant, inshallah, to the topic that we've discussed. And uh, subhanAllah, I, I think I've said, I, I wouldn't like to go further because they say cough mixture comes in doses. You can't have the whole bottle. You've just got to have five mils at a time, inshallah. There we are. Yes, sister. Um, what do you do um, when you find yourself questioning your intentions, even though you know exactly what your intentions were, but for some reason you're still questioning yourself? My beloved sister, if it is a good deed, firstly, if it's a fault, say for example, I'm, I need to do something that's compulsory. If your intentions are dilly-dallying, you will do the compulsory act. 
but you will work on your intention as time passes, inshallah. But if it's a deed that's not needed at all, uh, you know, because what shaitan does is he comes to us and tempers with our intention so that we do not do the things we are supposed to do. So someone says, you know, I'd like to do this appropriately, but I don't want to do it to show this person. But hang on, whether you are thinking that or, or not, that statement must not make you stop doing what you really have to do. Then you can later on work on your intention. For example, Salah. Some people say, well, look, I can read Salah, but if I stand in that corner and read my Salah, everybody's going to watch me, and, and you know, uh, I don't want them to watch me, so let me leave the Salah. It's worse to leave the Salah than to read that Salah, and you've got a slight problem with your intention. You need to rectify it. I'm not saying no, but it is an, a secondary issue. It's an issue that comes with it, and uh, we should work on it as soon as possible, but it must not stop us from doing that which is necessary. Wallahu a'lam. I hope I've helped. Answer that a little bit. No. Okay, if, if you would like to write the question, you can pass it down as well and let it come down. And if you want to fire live, inshallah, we can take live rounds. <laughs> there are pins and papers. Yes, brother. It's not uh, too much related to uh, your speech, but you are I prefer if it was related to the speech. No. But anyway, let's see, let's see, inshallah. Yeah. Okay. So long as you're not using me to shoot somebody else, then it's fine. No, no, no. Okay. In England, it's more problem system, like uh, our economic system, like, and our also social system. Uh, just uh, we can't do anything uh, properly, and so we do it. But we face a lot of things. My brother, if you have uh, a problem with economic systems and social systems and so on, what you need to do is uh, live within whatever you have to as a Muslim, make the most and you know, saddidu wa qaribu. You come as close as you can to what you're supposed to be doing and inshallah, we don't compromise our fa'ayl, we don't compromise that which we are supposed to be doing and inshallah, you know, it's not that bad where you cannot practice your deen. I think you could. I know sometimes even the economic system is such that you have to open bank accounts and you have to engage in one thing or two or three. You know, we try to do uh, the least that would be incorrect in the sense that ideally we should not be doing anything that's wrong. But if, for example, you have to put your monies into a bank and they're giving you the interest, for example, rather than eating it, take it out and give it to poor Muslims, if you know what I'm trying to say. So it's not so easy to live in an environment that is uh, not an Islamic environment, but you have to make the most of it. One thing you need to know, and I need to clarify, is many people think, you know, the non-Muslims are our enemies, and we're supposed to fight them, and you know, we support... No, that's the that's mentality that's not correct. We, we are living in the non-Muslim world, being bro born and brought up in the non-Muslim world. We have some brilliant people, some of them have overtaken us in character and conduct. In deen, we have a better deen, that, there's no doubt, no doubt at all. But some of them have overtaken us in honesty, in character, in conduct, in dedication, you know, in selflessness and so on. They've gone far beyond and we've got to learn from some of those to see that, look, these people, they've actually gone far beyond. And yet some people look at them hostile, you know. I've seen a brother once a few years ago, you know, not, if a non-Muslim passes, he goes, and he spits. What's that for? What is it for? And is that Islam? We are supposed to be looking at every non-Muslim as a potential Muslim. And the only way we will be able to try and make them even realize that it is a deen to be reckoned with is to be upright ourselves. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. When shaitan is always making you feel bad or worse or useless, like you mentioned, what is the best way to reach out your iman? My beloved brothers and sisters, that's a very beautiful question. A true believer is he who, when Allah is mentioned, his heart trembles. And when the verses of Allah are recited, the Iman is increased. I have a habit of reciting the verses. I've had some scholars, some of my lecturers, uh, you know, have told me that don't recite the verse, say it. And I said, Sheikh, when it is an Arabic lecture, I will say it. When it is an English lecture, I will recite it. 
The reason is we want to recite it to feel the impact of the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, no, don't do it. I said, I disagree with you with respect. There you are. And I feel it increases, it boosts you. There is no, I don't have to recite the verse. The reason why I would recite it is because of this verse. Allah says, when the verses are recited to you, they boost your iman if you're a true believer. So keep yourself in constant, keep yourself in constant contact with the book of Allah, with the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the stories of the predecessors and the stories of the past and the prophets of the past and so on. And inshallah, if you keep yourself connected to that, it will keep you on check. Believe me. But the moment, you know, Everyone else is with us whole day. You know, we have Britney Spears accompanying us to Leeds or for example to Bradford. And on the way back, mashallah, we have who else? We have the late Michael Jackson. And as we turn the corner, we have the woman I mentioned last night, Lady Gaga, <laughs> and so on. And if that's the case, what happens to our Iman? You know? And then come the evening, and I'm going to say this because it's the menace of the age. Come the evening, we're checking our internet and everything, and suddenly we, something happens and people get hooked onto pornography. That destroys us. Do you know how bad, how bad pornography is? It destroys the, 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 the mind, it destroys the physical strength of the individual, the emotional strength, the respect of the opposite sex is reduced completely or quite a bit, and the person starts fantasizing things in their mind, their energies are usurped, their concentration levels in Salah will become almost nil, and their spirituality is starting to be, you know, it's like a spiritual suicide being committed. And that's what happens, and people are hooked. When I say hooked, I have a group of youngsters whom we are very close to, and you know, it's good to listen to them and to get to talk to them, and they tell me, hey, Sheikh, you don't know what's going on. And I said, no, I do, man. And when you tell them you do, when you start telling them, you know, yesterday I spoke of the half bummers, my nephew seated here, mashallah, he was telling me, oh, that was a good one. I said, but I don't know what they're called, but I call them half bummers because I have been a victim. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> when I say a victim, I mean, I went to the masjid where I just had to move my place. Allahu Akbar. Because what should you do? You have a brother, if you tell him something, you won't see him in the masjid again. So someone says, at least he's coming to the masjid. But brother, don't display your backsides in the house of Allah. You know, we have... Stop. Okay, we have... You know the kufiyas on the head? In the masjid, a lot of the masajid, sometimes you notice some spare ones on the side there. I wonder what other spare things we'd need. Allah, Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So, what is going on is something very bad. When you want to increase your iman, Decrease your link with the devil and you find your iman will increase. It's like a seesaw. The more you have of the devil, the less you'll have of Allah. The more you have of Allah, the less you will have of the devil. And whenever shaitan makes you feel useless, fight him. Tell him, no ways. I know Allah loves me. Believe me, Allah loves every one of us. Without exception. Allah loves all of you. Without exception. It's us sometimes. When I was coming in, I was with the brother, somebody emailed me. An interesting email. It's something that probably is created, but let me share it with you. It says there, there was a man who entered the barbers. And when he sat down, the barber started trimming up. And the barber said, you know, you'd look so much more handsome without your beard. And he says, no, it's Allah's instruction. And I'd like to follow the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, what? I don't believe there is Allah. The barber is saying, I don't believe there is Allah. There is no Allah. So this young man says, why? He says, because if there was an Allah, there would be no, but look at the streets. Go out on the street and see there's no Allah. What do you mean there's no Allah? If there was Allah, there wouldn't be suffering, there wouldn't be pain, there wouldn't be all these people who are agonizing across the globe and everything. So there is no Allah. This man decided, okay, I don't have much knowledge. Let me just keep quiet, get my haircut and walk out. So he got his haircut, he walked out. And when he walked out, he saw a man. And this man had ugly, shabby hair, dirty, long beard, and he was, you know, like, like a tramp walking, and suddenly something came to the mind of this individual. He ran back into the barber shop, and he says, you know what? There's no barbers in this world. He says, what do you mean there's no barbers? There's no barbers. What do you mean there's no barbers? I'm a barber, I just cut your hair, man. He says, well, if there were barbers, there wouldn't be people around there with all this long hair and everything, you know, without cut, without being cut and trimmed and neat and prim and prop. He says, but you're so foolish, the barber says. Why? If they don't come to me, how can I cut their hair? There you are. 
So this young man says, well, there you are. Allah is there. If you don't go to Allah, what do you expect in return? A lots and lots of pain and agonization and so on. So if you see pain and everything, it's because the people haven't turned to Allah. So yes, mashallah, that is an email I got just now, about 10, 15 minutes ago it was, meaning before I came. And in the vehicle I was reading it, and here I am sharing it with you. I thought maybe it has a message which is a little bit interesting, inshallah. So my brother, Jazakallah for your question, it helped, or the sister it was, I think. Ah, no thanks, water late, inshallah. <laughs> Do you have to tell your future husband your past sins? The answer is no, and no. No, it's a fact. I, I'm, I'm giving you a one word answer, but it's, it's a problem. You don't need to say anything. It's between you and Allah, and Allah forgives you. He is not Ghafur Rahim, nor is He your Lord. No is anything, no it is nothing, not at all. Allah, <laughs> With regards to good deeds, sometimes the thought crosses our mind that maybe the reason we are doing it is to give ourselves inner peace rather than the satisfaction of Allah. Is this correct? How can we overcome this? Inshallah, we are doing everything for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as for inner peace, definitely. So if you have a combination of both, there's no problem. Not at all. It's not wrong to say I'm doing this for my own inner peace because it is part and parcel of Allah's pleasure because it is Allah who can give you inner peace. Wallahu <coughs> a'lam. If you have to work at a place for some reason and uh, they, there is no praying facilities there, what are you supposed to do? Do you just pray your qada? My beloved brothers and sisters, it, that's a difficult question. Salah is something that should never ever be missed. Even if it means you're sitting in the lecture hall, you know, everybody's busy and you're busy reading your salah while sitting and you do your rukur by moving slightly <coughs> forward, Sami Allahu liman hamida and you sujood a little bit more than that, I think that would be better than to leave it to, to become qada. Because we don't have any reason for our salah to be qada. We shouldn't leave it. We should fulfill our salah no matter where we are. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us goodness. Obviously, you will need to ask your local scholars. Maybe, you know, they might have other solutions for you. Because I don't know the, the situations here exactly. But I do know, do know other varsities. Sometimes they tell you, you know, we've got... Uh, lectures that run into through a whole salah time like from just before Maghrib right through to the time of Isha and so on what to do there, there have been ulama who have answered the way I have Wallahu alam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and create ease for us all inshallah Difficult question. Can you ask your possible spouse if they have committed X, Y sin regarding, for example, chastity? I think referring to adultery, I guess, or, you know, if they've had sex before marriage, can you ask them? But the reality is, look, as, as an individual and human being, you can ask them. It's not going to cut ice. What will it do to you? It will just make you start doubting things. It will make you start uh, thinking things. It will make you... Uh, a lot of the times I say these type of sins are between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they do something when they are married to you, now we're talking something else. But prior to them being married to you, you may ask. It's not wrong, meaning if you feel that that's what you want, nobody's going to say don't ask. But sometimes they may lie to you. A lot of people would not like to tell the truth. And some, and you would, you know, like some people say, ask no questions and you shall hear no lies. I don't know if you've heard that. But that's what it is, that if you ask no questions, you won't hear lies. But if you're putting someone in a corner, they may not tell you. But there are consequences to questions. So think of the consequences. So sometimes you want to know, they might tell you, yes, yes, you know what? And then you'll start saying, okay, who? And then name 10 people you know. You say, oh, no. <laughs> so there are consequences. So what I'm saying is think about it. It's, everyone has, for example, certain things they wouldn't be proud of telling other people. And so let it be that way, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us assistance. Can women visit the graveyard? The answer is, according to some ahadith, 
لعن الله زائرات القبور is one narration Allah has cursed the women who visit graveyards so that's one narration which would say don't go and there is another narration which says لعن الله زوارات القبور Allah has cursed the women who frequent the graveyards so that would mean do not frequent the graveyards so there are two opinions in fiqh both of them are correct which means uh, those who you know I think the Hanabila and the Hanafiya are, are a little bit more strict and they say you shouldn't go at all and the, the others the, the Shafi'i and the, the, the Maliki uh, they, they take the other opinion to say, if it is once in a while in the condition of Tahara and you really have to go and for a bare minimum of time with certain conditions, then you may go as, for as long as you don't frequent and you come out uh, as soon as possible. So it's, it's a minor issue, inshallah, meaning uh, I've explained it as best as I could. Laziness and how to combat it, it's a difficulty. You need motivation in life, you need to be able to focus, you need to have a goal and you need to be self-determined. You also need to have a healthy diet. Sometimes when you don't have a healthy diet, too many sugars result in the candida, in the belly, probably multiplying, and you feel lazy and lethargic and so on, and you don't know. And someone comes and says, hey, just check if I got a gin. Just check for me if I got a gin. <laughs> it's not the gin, it's too many cokes sometimes. So, so we need to know our diet needs to be correct, our sleep needs to be correct. Unnecessary, uh, you know, staying awake at night especially with the computer, you can, we get carried away sometimes. It happens to all of us, myself included, where you're doing something before you know it, wow, it's three hours gone. You need to be able to say goodbye, switch it off. Even if people say, you haven't replied me, I'm sorry, I'm just a human being. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So if you've got your sleep in order, your eating in order, your link with Allah in order, your goals in order, inshallah, it will help you to combat that laziness. Over and above that, you need motivation. So get something that will motivate you, inshallah. You know, you need motivation. What do you want to do? If you're not motivated for it, you're going to feel lazy. You tell someone, listen, you know what? We've got a ticket to Honolulu on holiday, five star, mashallah. And we've been given a yacht there. The flight's leaving at 3.30 from London. What will happen? We'll get up at 2 in the morning, not even 2, well before that. And we'll be at the airport two, three hours early. Why? Because motivation is something. You're going to achieve something. So the same applies, inshallah, when we have uh, motivation for something, we feel more to do it and less lazy. Can you mention non-mahram in your du'a? The answer is yes, you can mention non-mahram in your du'a for as long as it's a sensible du'a. <laughs> what is the best cure for depression, especially when it stops you living your life? My beloved brothers and sisters, hatred, jealousy, envy, uh, you know, diseases of the heart, loss of Iman when you don't have faith in Allah, lack of belief in destiny and predestiny, all these result in depression. When you hate someone, it, it, it makes you, it bogs you down. It makes you start doing things that are very unnecessary. When you backbite and you gossip about people, you should know that there are others who are backbiting about you and gossiping. And believe me, that bogs you down. It ties you down to the ground. And it has a long-term effect. So the best bet is don't hate people. And you know, if you really don't like someone, stay away from them. But don't develop a hatred where you now need to do all small, small things to make their lives difficult. And you know, I wouldn't like to see them succeed. And why are they looking so beautiful? And why have they passed their exams? And why have they this? And I shouldn't. So now we go and tell tales and we do this and we paste this on Facebook and we cause a problem. And we get hold of all their friends and typical, typical attitude. Where you get hold of all their friends and send them a message of how ugly she is and how ugly he is. Why would that happen? All that results in more and more depression, it compounds it. To solve the matter, develop your link with Allah. Be happy with what Allah has given you. I tell a lot of people, and I've said it in the past, I think even in, in, in a university lecture in the past, what do you want to depress about? What is it? Is it because you're not succeeding or something's not happening? That's Allah's decision. If you've tried your best and your hardest, then leave the rest in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, some people can't, maybe they, they're taking a bit long to get married. That might be the best thing for you. Allah might be protecting you from a deformed child. Allah protect us all. And Allah grant cure to all those who have children who are challenged. And all those who are challenged themselves. But Allah might be protecting you from something so big. Ask the sisters who are divorced, gone through a torrid, horrible divorce. They'll tell you, sister, it's better to remain single than to be in oppression. Wallahi. Wallahi, they'll tell you that. 
So don't worry. Allah has His ways, His methods. Try your best and may Allah open the doors for all of us. Everyone has their dreams. You need to adjust those dreams sometimes. Did you hear what I said? Everyone has dreams. You need to adjust them sometimes. You can't always have things the way you want them. Last question. Somebody asked me, when next are you going to come to UK? I left that question out. The reason is, I wanted to say, you're getting irritated of me already. <laughs> so, last question. MashaAllah. Barakallah. Okay, I've answered that question already, so we can take one more, inshallah. It's about the non mahams I think we all want to make dua for non muslims <laughs> What is the difference between ibadah to please Allah and to enter Jannah? It's quite similar to the previous question that was asked. You know, the people of Jannah will be divided into a few categories. Those who will enter Jannah because they did deeds in order to enter Jannah. They will enter Jannah. Those who did deeds in order to please Allah, they will also enter Jannah. So you can enter Jannah in both ways. So you can do a deed in order to enter Jannah. It will also be for the pleasure of Allah. But if you have done deeds solely for the pleasure of Allah, it's also... It's all connected, you know, it's all definitely connected. So uh, there is a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wherein he makes mention of uh, some of the people of Jannah would enter Jannah because they uh, abstained from sins fearing Jahannam. So Allah granted them entry into Jannah. And some of them, uh, they, they did good deeds in order to get to Jannah. And some of them did good deeds and abstained from sins solely for the love of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will also get Jannah. So we, we're heading in the same direction. I can give you another example. Whether you're in Leeds or Bradford or whether you're elsewhere, you'll still get your degree, inshallah. I hope you understood what I said. Which means you might have different uh, lecturers, different halls, but you're still heading in one direction. I think with that, we come to an end. Uh, would I like to take, I can take all of those, inshallah. We wouldn't, yes, we're running out of time. Okay, the auction, mashallah. I think we'll, we'll stop there. Brother. If there is anyone who wants to ask me a question, firstly, you ask the ulama who you know, the ulama whom you, you, you know, who are around you, who've been helping you through your life, the ulama you are comfortable with. If you really, really need to ask me a question, my email is available, muftimenk at gmail.com. There is also a Facebook page you can follow, uh, facebook.com slash muftimenk, or a Twitter account which has the same name, inshallah. You may follow it, it has a message or two. I think more Twitter is more uh, <coughs> informal compared to the Facebook. So if you'd like to follow that, uh, you may benefit. If you don't, you can always uh, unlike, inshallah. We <laughs> ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. It was really an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, in your midst. And I pray that Allah accept us all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.